Golden Spiral Media presents The Blacklist Exposed. Please return to your seats as the captain has turned on the seatbelt sign for our cryogenic flight this week on The Blacklist Exposed. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. Put your thumbs in the box and your seats in their upright positions. We are in for a bumpy ride. Thanks for joining us this week as we discuss number 86 in the blacklist, Sir Crispin Crandall, which aired November 5th, 2015, and was written by the Dave Thomas. <laughs> Is that what you said? The Dave Thomas? That's what he goes by on Twitter. All right. And directed by Amy Kanan Man. I hope I said that right. I'm sorry. Uh, show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. We asked, and you responded, to our iTunes review, trick or treat, and thanks contest. This week, 10 new reviews. Way to go. Congrats to Ms. Jackie K. from USA and Supreme Soccer Man from USA for being the 5th and 10th reviewers this week. They receive an extra entry into the drawing for the grand prize, a copy of Season 1 and 2 of The Blacklist. This week, reviewers number 8 and 6, see what I did there? will be the second chance winners, so keep those reviews coming. We need another 10 this week. Remember, 40 new reviews in total by Thanksgiving is the target, so don't wait. Get them in today. But seriously, thank you. Kind words all around, and uh, we'll read those later in the show. Now, we asked you last week to answer our profiling question, which was, how will wrestler facilitate working with the director? <sighs> Man. Well, Neil said, wrestler will try to keep the director out of the loop as much as possible, he should try to do as much as possible while the director's off doing his own secret things. It seems pretty accurate from what I saw. Les, uh, Lasile? Lasile? How, many, how you say that? How would Close you say enough. that? All right. Wrestler should get the director drunk and give him a bar of soap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Bill said wrestler will use Cooper as a go-between. Carol said wrestler better not let Aram talk to the director. Aram does not know the meaning of a poker face. Doesn't like the song either. Mm-mm. Oh, nobody does. I'm just kidding. I got it on my Spotify. Uh, great answers this week, but we got a doozy for you because we got two left before it is over for the fall. So what are we going to do for him this week, Aaron? Well, there is a lot from this episode that alludes to an end game in this fall season finale, right? Like there's an end game coming. So the question is, what is Red's end game to clear Liz? And I still don't think the end game is going to happen by the fall finale. I say cliffhanger. I don't. I think she's she's cleared by the finale. That's I'm still calling it. That's what I'm saying. All right. Well, let's find out what all went down and if we can put a thumb on the situation as we discuss uh, this week's case profile. Uh, I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> How many thumb jokes can we get in one episode? That's really what the question is. All right. Well, before we get into what happened, I got to ask you, Troy, what did you think overall the episode? Because I think you and I are on different sides of a, of a fence. I could say after watching it a second time, it, it absolutely was what I thought it was, which was a filler episode to set up something for later. And mm -hmm. knowing that I knew that going in, kind of, and then I saw it unfold in front of my eyes. I was okay with it because I knew that that had to happen. 22 episodes in a season. We've talked about this mm -hmm. uh, all in season two, that the show should be like a 16 episode, like Walking Dead style, just to cut out some of that fluff. So because I knew it was a setup episode, I just enjoyed it for what it was rather than thinking, oh, they didn't pay off this or pay off that. I, I just knew it wasn't going to be up to you know the par that we've had going up to this point. So I just kind of put that there, and then I was like, I'm just going to enjoy it for what it was. And it was kind of interesting, kind of fun. I knew all that and just didn't like it. <laughs> I, didn't. I tried. I, uh, let me say that. Let me rephrase that. I don't. I don't dislike it. Like I hate this episode or something. It's just I could. It felt very much like I'm a huge 24 fan. This is my best example. Every season is 24. You have 24 episodes, and you always have several episodes. And we've talked about, like you said before, where you always have some some filler episodes of just. We just have to go through the motions to get to the last five minutes because that's setting up the next couple episodes, right? That's all this was, and that's all it felt like. And I felt the, like the plot was out there. <laughs> At times throughout the episode, I was wondering if it was still the blacklist because I'm like, I think this might be Fringe. I don't know what just happened. Are we in Fringe territory? Because it feels like Fringe, and I've never even seen Fringe. 
Yeah, I was looking to see if uh, J.R. Orsi was on this one because this was a clear kind of really um, almost an homage to, I believe it was season two, episode four of The Fridge called Momentum Deferred. And where it was talking about cryogenics. And I was like, well, this is really creepy. <laughs> a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about what the story was. Now we kind of have our take and where we stand in terms of the episode. Death is a process. That's really what the theme of the episode is, if I had to come up with one. Basically, we're following a people freezer airliner in the sky. Uh, between the, uh, in the opening, between the music selection and Crandall's aviator glasses, I kind of thought we were in a disco tech to start. <laughs> It was it was very very funky. I have oh. to say though that this was a really interesting part of the episode when it started because as the rumbling was happening, you weren't quite sure where they were if they were like being drilled underground if they were in a plane and it was turbulence. I almost thought it was an effect they added because they were talking about his brain and unlocking him from his brain. Mm -hmm. So I thought the rumbling was actually kind of from the perspective of uh, the mathematician economist doctor guy that was in the wheelchair or whatever. I thought it was him that was like having like a brain aneurysm or something. So I kind of thought that was cool. And then it was like, oh, we're just in an airplane. <laughs> well, I had uh, I had flashbacks to Cl uh, Clockwork Orange. I had a couple of those. Oh, yeah. But I just came out of the new Bond movie, Spectre. So I had an image of over-the-top Bond villains in my head. So I'm like, maybe they're in a volcano. And Ooh, that'd be cool, <laughs> too. <laughs> Turns out it wasn't much crazier than that. So, <laughs> But whatever. Well, we're after... And, and, Andres Holmey, yeah, yep, close enough. Everybody that ever listens, you know, I suck at pronunciation. So you, Andres Holmey, I believe they, just call, him, they call him Holmey for the rest of the episode. They call him anyway, Holmey. So. Yeah, and there should be a drinking game for every time they throw that out there this episode because there's a lot of lot of Andre, lot of Holmey, lot of Holmey going on. But he has pertinent info Red needs for his super master plan, and apparently he was taken as a member of Crandall's Ark. Gearing up for an apocalypse, apparently by removing, they removed the brain. Is that the way I understood it? it? I couldn't quite tell because then you go into the popsicle side and their full bodies are intact. So well, that was like a separate thing. Those were people that volunteered. Oh, the gotcha. Okay. Volunteers were there. They volunteered and signed waivers. They were cool. That is part of his business. But he also was kidnapping geniuses. Uh, yeah, 32 of them. Yeah, I 32 was, of them. Right? Yeah, he's building his own little arc and he's stealing their brains and freezing them. Oh, okay, so I missed that part because, like I said, the episode was confusing a little bit because you're trying to figure out where was the 32 that were part of the arc, and then there's all these other people that are on the ground in the cryogenic freezer warehouse, but then there's the people that are in the same kind of tubes up on the airplane, so it's like which ones are part of the crab experiment and which ones are part of this new experiment, and that's where it really got confusing for me. Now, you know what this episode was? This was your grandmother without taking her medicine. And she's home alone. That's what this is. It is off the rocker. It all over the place. I don't know what the heck is going on half the time. <laughs> it's very all over the map. Can we mention how once again someone on Red's list that he was pursuing, he didn't actually know who he was pursuing until mid episode. You know what I mean? It's been like two or three episodes in a row. I, I agree. I was trying to watch it on the second watch. Was did he? Because I think this time he actually knew who Crispin Crandall was. He just didn't realize that he was pursuing Crispin Crandall. To get to Holmey. So it's a little bit different than last week where he clearly did not know who Ariok Kane was at all. But that's like but yeah, two or same, th yeah. same concept, yeah. But two or three in a row. So uh, I guess one thing we need to talk about here is, is this changing how we perceive the blacklist itself? Yeah, I mean, because even when he's having that conversation with Wrestler, he's like on the phone, he's like, I'm going to give you the next name on the blacklist. And, he, and I'm like, Sir Crispin Crandall, and he's like, no, he goes with Andrews Holmey, and I'm like, wait, what? That's not the episode title. I don't, I don't get it. So, are is it? Are we reading too much into it? And is the title of this episode not really the blacklister anymore, even though they give him a number? And that's the part that's confusing. Yeah, it, it's very confusing to me. And in terms of the blacklist itself, because I think we've always felt like we had a good handle for what that blacklist was. This is Red's list of people he needs to get rid of for whatever, right? For various reasons. He obviously has a different agenda once the Fulcrum comes out, but still has an agenda. Yeah, and it, it was a very purposeful process, right? The The first setup was to get information to get to Lucy Brooks. The second, inf the second set was information to find out who Berlin was. Then the second information was to find Berlin's daughter to get, kill Berlin eventually. Mm -hmm. And then the next set was to get to the fulcrum. And now this next set is going to be, you know, obviously to clear Liz's name. But these blacklisters don't, again, seem like they're people that Red has dealt with on a regular basis where everything from season one and season two, he clearly knew who he was targeting. 
Yeah. So to me, it, it really throws up there. What is the blacklist? Is the blacklist ultimately determined by who gets arrested or is it uh, arrested? No, uh, no. Uh, nah, nah, dad joke. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out if they're changing what the blacklist means or if they're saying that maybe Red doesn't always know who is on his list. He just has, you know, by the end of the episode, we'll know who it is. Which kind of goes into the situation with Red these last couple of weeks because for the first two seasons, he's always been the one in control. He's mm-hmm. always got, you know, everything, you know, planned out except for when he got shot. And then in these episodes here, he got duped by Solomon and Vargas. And then he's basically got almost duped again by Solomon on the plane because he didn't even know that they were on his tail. So I think it's showing there's a sense of vulnerability for Red. And the question becomes, what is that vulnerability? Is the vulnerability Liz because he's just doing this to clear her name and not advancing his criminal empire or his own agenda like he was in the first two seasons? Yeah, I'm really curious where we're going to go. I mean, these last two episodes are going to weigh in heavily on how we see this i am sure and and i look forward to that but let's get back to the main plot of the story which was very thin in my opinion but like we said earlier they were definitely trying to dangle some threads that can be tied up over the next couple weeks did you notice this is the second time now that we've talked about preserving humanity human life Mm -hmm. we had we had the guy last year that was looking for you know to be able to live forever and here we're talking about crispin crandall doing these cryogenic experiments so that he could basically restore humanity after some great uh, cataclysmic event. And I believe in both episodes, they talk about the extension level events in both episodes. So mm-hmm. it's interesting. I'm wondering if there's an ELE event coming in 2017. Well, that's what I was wondering because 2017 is the date that keeps band- being bandied about. And I would think with people I've, I've seen, I've caught glimpses of nods to this idea before is that what we're building up to? Are we building up to maybe by this the end of this season, there is an extinction level event because it'll be the end of 2016. They're going to be building into 2017. I think it's quite possible, man. Which would then make it a perfect pairing for heroes because it'd be an awesome crossover with this season that's going on. Yeah, I don't watch that show. I'm too busy living life. So <laughs> very religious overtones this week. The arc. You think? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, if there was a nail anywhere in this episode, there would be a hammer all over it. I am serious, man, because it was right on the head. The Ark, Salvation of Mankind, the director's little Bible lesson, where he says he wants to be a priest. That was We'll talk about that more later. You Did, forgot the uh, they came on the Ark 2x2, two two, male and female as well. <laughs> yeah, they came on the Ark 2x2. Two two. I assume this was intentional. It you? has to be. I mean, <laughs> th- th- there's no reason why they would make it that blatantly obvious. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing if you're like, yeah, he's got an arc of people and it's like a bunch of people here, there, there, whatever. But the fact that he specifically had a male and a female of the same discipline, because they couldn't just marry anybody. It had to be an economist with an economist and a mathematician with a mathematician. Mm-hmm. So he's literally building like a master race for whenever the, the flood comes, whatever the flood is. Now, do you think here, here's my question in terms of this episode. Do you think they did it so blatantly? Because I mean, seriously, the only thing missing was like a pie chart of some kind where they were like, two by two, get on the airplane and they gonna and then we're all gonna die. You know, it's just something like that. Do you think they they did that so blatantly just to make sure that we pay very close attention to the fact that an event is coming and the world is in jeopardy? I absolutely think so. I mean, it was it was short of a dove flying out the airplane window or something. <laughs> it was so blatantly <laughs> obvious that they're truly trying to set up that there's a war or something bigger, greater, nuclear bomb. I, it could be anything, right? But it's going to be something so catastrophic that there has to be preservation of humanity of some kind because we've had numerous preservation of humanity stories mm-hmm. over the last season and a half. We have. We just had the plant one not too long ago, the food. Right, Remember? exactly. Yeah, so it, it keeps coming up. Pay attention, guys. If if anybody has any theories on where we're heading, I really want to hear them because I, I think there's probably clues in here that everybody has missed, and I'm, I'm curious if anybody has pieced this together. Do you think this episode was a bit too sci-fi for normal casual fans? Uh, cryogenics have been around. I mean, you talk a little bit about um, – like, I'm going to totally botch it because I don't watch baseball that often, but there was the baseball guy. Was it uh, Williams? I'm trying to remember that – where he was full of that cryogenic stuff. So I think cryogenics isn't too sci-fi, but I think that for the casual blacklist watcher and that we've been doing more standardized criminal procedures, granted they're a little bit more graphic in nature, Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, if, to go the sci-fi route and then have a lab in a plane. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's probably a little bit of a stretch for a casual viewer. That fuel is in the air. Well, which... they, they do that now with the military, so that's not too far of a stretch. But the fact that he would want to do that so he doesn't have to land because he doesn't want to get caught, that's a different situation. Ah, but is it he doesn't want to get caught or he doesn't want to take a chance of being on the ground when the event happens? Ooh, I didn't even think of that. That's you what I thought. one smart cookie. Mm, that's what I think of. I think he doesn't. he didn't know... When that event was coming. The one thing that bothered me about the episode, because at the end, Red just shoots him, which, once again, I don't understand why he killed the guy, I'm, other than he could. No, he killed him because he made a point. What was He's the like, point? The point was, you're trying to preserve yourself for later, because the whole point is the now. And he's like, oh, you know, but we're not going to gamble. He's like, okay, well, let's take a, let's take a chance on that. <laughs> and then he like, <laughs> proves his point by killing him. You're dead now, so now All you're right. screwed. You can't finish your stuff. But I guess my question is, I, I didn't hear Red ask the question that I would have asked if I were Red. Well, I guess, I mean, outside of I would have looked at myself in the mirror because I'm awesome. But the question he would have asked him after he looked in the mirror was, what is the event you're worried about? I, I didn't hear that addressed specifically. I'm sure Red knows the event, though, because he knows 2017 is around the corner. You think You think he knows what's coming? I think he's got a general idea, mm. and especially if he has the information from the fulcrum, because I'm sure this event has been planned for quite some time. All right. It'll be really interesting. I'm really curious where we're going in these last two episodes. So let's get into the characters and see what happened this week with, with our char characters specifically and their little sub stories. Cooper really didn't do a whole lot, except he went all scoldy on Tom. Yeah, he kind of stared him down with his glasses. It almost looked like he was trying to like read into his soul. Like, why did you do this? <laughs> it felt like a dad lecture. <laughs> it totally felt like a dad lecture. I'm like, if I was telling him, I'm going to my room, <laughs> taking my toys and going home. Don't eat at my Chinese restaurant. <laughs> uh, that's about all I got from Cooper this week. I, was there anything else you, you caught from his character? No, not really. I mean, I like the fact that he actually brought out um, the file on Vulcan because I think that was part of the things that were missing on the first pass it was like hey we think that he might be with these people but we didn't get a lot of information on those people mm -hmm. so him handing the file over at least gave us a little bit of information of what tom was walking into later in the episode okay. so we knew what the dire situation would be what about ash asher sutton he gone yeah i'm a little kind of disappointed that we introduced him and then he was actually kind of cool with tom i was almost hoping it was going to be like uh like bosom buddies they're going to tag team together or something <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a cool character, but yeah. And then we're supposed to like, I think, I guess the hard part is, is that they didn't develop it long enough for Asher's death to actually one, make you care about Asher, but two, actually make you care about Tom feeling sorry about killing Asher. They were friends, but they're not, they weren't really friends. You know, it's not like Red and Dembe where you would actually feel sorry if he died or you had to be put in that situation. Yeah. Hold that thought. Cause I'll come back to that. Yeah. I get really bummed when people with great hair get killed in a show because his hair was fantastic. Was just... I get bummed when people get to get killed that get to pull off cool yellow sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question in terms of Asher outside of, well, that sucks for him. And I feel like that storyline was just pointless. <laughs> what do you, what about Gwen? Where's yeah, Gwen let, at? Let, let's talk about Gwen because Tom spent a lot of time making sure Gwen was safe. Mm -hmm. And, I still say that there's something that's going to happen there because Tom's either going to come back and say, you know, hey, you know, they killed him. I did everything I could. And then Gwen's going to come running to Tom. And I, I just think there's going to be some issue with Gwen and Tom and Liz and some triangle or whatever going on in the future. It, it, there's got to be. Otherwise, it's going to be another one of these dangling threads. I, I think it'll be more of a revenge plot. Like she's going to go after Tom now because you got my man killed. Because she, she spent a lot of time last week being built up as a character and also building up their relationship. Like, he was very important to her. It almost felt like last week that Gwen was being built up to be an important character and Asher really wasn't. True. Yeah. True. So. Now, now, was she hiding outside? I was trying to figure out if that like, went out to a back porch or if that yeah, was like... She, yeah, she was hiding outside when Tom got took. But wouldn't, wouldn't somebody be coming around the back and find her? Um, maybe if they're thorough, apparently they're not thorough. Maybe they didn't know she's in the house. Man, you're overthinking it. I'm, I'm just saying, I was wondering maybe she this was This is the problem you have in a movie or in an episode about a guy flying a plane with a bunch of brains <laughs> <laughs> over, <laughs> over and refueling in the sky and a coming of extinction. You're worried about how do they not know she's in the backyard? This is, I can't buy into this. It's well, it, so it goes ridiculous. back to last week about how she was so interested in Tom. I still think that she might have been in on it the whole time and tipped him off and 
got him to the house. Man, you really don't trust her, do you? There's just something about her. I know. Something about her. And if they leave it dangling, I'll have to have a conversation with John when I get out to L.A. in March. <laughs> She's a little twitchy. That's what I'm thinking. She's a little yeah. twitchy. Well, Tom, he went into an underground fight club. Are we allowed to talk about that? I don't know what the rules are. I know the, I know the first rule. And the first rule was we don't talk about it on Under the Dome Radio, our other podcast. So I guess uh, this doesn't count. So if you want to talk about it, we can here. Okay. I don't. Uh, how did you connect Under the Dome into this? That's just like a side there, plug. There was a there was a Fight Club scene, and it was one of the worst episodes of the show. Oh, well, there was a great movie called Fight Club. There was. Yeah, and Tom apparently got wrapped into one with a another um, uh, vertically challenged person. They are really not that came out so wrong as it always. There's no nice way to say that a, a short person is cast. And I wanted to bring that up, not because I'm making jokes, but because I really appreciate that the show has such diversity. Yes, they absolutely. Continuously employ actors that I don't see on standard I, I, on CBS. You know what I'm saying? You never see this cast. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I love the the taking chances and making sure everybody feels like they're part of the universe because there are so many dedicated fans in the universe as well. Mm-hmm. You know, black, white, Asian, whatever, doesn't matter. The fact that they can incorporate it all because I think whatever this ELE event could be is going to affect all of us. And I love that they're bringing that in. I love that they're bringing the, they're showcasing everybody's part of this world. You know, you've got little people, tall people, black people, white people, Asian people, um, people with d- disabilities. I mean, it's just they've covered the gamut and not many shows on television do that and we should definitely even though it's an episode i didn't like or didn't love didn't like eh, somewhere in the middle (laughs) um i i still find something to respect about it and that's that's very admirable in my opinion so what do you think about this storyline where he's at this underground fight club and he's forced to fight asher and then he kills him and he actually says don't make me do this huh you're the whole reason i'm here jackass (laughs) what (laughs) what do you mean (laughs) Yeah, I wasn't sure what he was like. He was trying to save him at the same time, or if he was just like, I, I really don't want to kill you because I like you. And then the fact that the knife comes out, and he, the fact that he doesn't take a punch at all, right? And doesn't even make it try to look halfway decent like he's trying. Mm-hmm. But then he immediately goes and grabs the knife and then stabs him. I'm wondering if this is the same kind of thing where, you know, we talk about that warrior gene, like we had with Red dropping what, uh, when to go off the roof last week. Yeah, it's like they snap, right? It's like they're they're at this point where he's like, "I'm trying to not kill you. I'm trying to not kill you." And it's like, and I saw him. Oh, I just got to do it. And he gets the knife in his throat. That's not a warrior, so Gene. He's just an assassin. I mean, he's Tom is not a good guy. I don't care how much they build him up to be a good guy. He's not a good guy. It took out like four guys at the end of the episode with no problem. There isn't a way that he couldn't figure out how to get out of that situation. Oh, he just, wanted to get caught. He needed well, to get yeah, caught. But I don't think he wanted to kill Asher. Um, well, let me tell you. When you're in a fight to the death and you say to the guy, don't make me do this, he's just trying. He really wasn't even trying very hard. I'm telling you, Tom could have not killed him if he really didn't want to. Um, yeah, I'm ser- I am 100% certain there could have been a way out of that situation without having to kill Asher. Or he could have actually used Asher so that way they would have like tried to attack them. And then Asher would have gotten stabbed in the crossfire, so Tom would have mm. had to actually do the killing. Just totally proves my theory that Tom is jealous of, of Asher's mane. That's really what it boils down to. Uh, Eg- or, his is, ye- or his yellow sweater. <laughs> right. Eggold has been great this season. I, I don't want to display him, the actor, because I think he's done a great job. And he's actually impressed me quite a bit with how he has bounced around in different characters, even even as he's been Tom slash whatever. He, he has remained in character where, whatever the part was required or whatever was required of the part, I should say. Yeah, he's actually like um, – I, I liken it to Fringe with uh, John Noble's character where he's got to play almost three different personalities. You know, so to have an actor to have that depth of range is just really awesome to see the craft actually come to life on the screen. Right. The, the only problem I have is with his character, I feel like they're shoehorning him into every episode to make his character make sense. And I just – this Fight Club thing didn't work for me. I, I thought it was a little silly, honestly. What about you? Well, it, they, they said it's, you know, he worked, you know, Volkoff is running this Fight Club, you know, and Kara Kurt is with him. So the fact that they did this Fight Club thing, it still fit the story because it was to get to Kara Kurt. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit contrived on how to get to Kara Kurt. Maybe it could have just been a drug smuggling ring or something. But the fact that they end up bringing Asher versus Tom together 
that's either contrived or brilliant because we don't see the master plan behind Gwen. I guess, yeah. I guess you could look at it either way. I think Gwen's going to really pay in, play into uh, everything as it comes out. I'm hoping. Because I, I don't think you spend that much time on developing a character and then just drop her. Right? I, I guess so, yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> you don't sound Vanessa, convinced. Vanessa, you, go back to, well, you can go back to Vanessa Cruz. You go back to Gina Zanatakos. I mean, there's all these, like, dangling chads of females. So what if it ends up being some giant female criminal crime ring? Because they talked about making Ocean's Eleven with all females. So maybe we're wow. coming to something like that. That is an extreme connection, which that's full Heinrichs right there. All right. Now let's go to uh, Aram. Did do a whole lot. Just a lot of psych- uh, Tycho Babel. I didn't really get a whole lot of his character this week. You? Nope, nothing. Okay. Nothing. Marvin Gerard returns. Woo-hoo. So he's still, Fisher Stevens, still out there kicking. He's still part of the master plan. What the heck is the master plan? And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Was there, when he, they said, we can do this if we hit all the green lights. Was it more things, or was it specifically like, oh, hey, Homie's got all this money for the director? <laughs> no, so I we've think... actually found that part of the fulcrum, or is this just a piece of the whole puzzle? Oh, no, I think Gerard is a piece of the puzzle. Like, he's looking at the final game, and this was a part of it. They had okay. to get into this bank. They had to uh, orchestrate this bank robbery so they could get, you know, drop the thumbs off <laughs> and get the money they needed so that they had some leverage on the director and move to the next phase. So I think he's part of the, the long con. I, I'm just I'm just kind of trying to figure out what this long con could possibly be. Yeah, no clue. Yeah, not me either. I tried to guess all season one, and I saw I never saw Lucy Brooks coming. <laughs> and he's like, "No, she's your wife." It's like I knew Tom was bad, but I didn't realize Lucy Brooks was going to be bad. That was kind of a mm-hmm. over the head kind of thing. Yeah, I think where I think where they end up is going to be different than where we think they're going to end up. So it should be fun. Should be a fun ride. Next couple episodes, man. I'm really looking forward to it. Dembe. And that's what, keep, and that's what keeps you around, right? Because if, if they hit you over the head and you're like, I never saw that coming, then you're in for four, five, six, seven, depending on how many seasons they go. Yeah, that's true. Dembe uh, seems like he heals really fast, honestly. Yeah, he does. Miracle blood. <laughs> Miracle blood. <laughs> Miraku, if you watch Arrow. Uh, <laughs> so uh, th- that was pretty funny. But outside of that, he's really just, he's in heal mode. He didn't have a whole lot going on. No, no cool Dembe moments this week. But I did have some favorite Samar moments. Not just the the odd little shifts and looks she was giving wrestler here and there, but her low cut shirts are back. Thank you, thank you, science. And I wanted to know: Did you catch the director like gawking down her shirt the first time through? I didn't, and then I saw you type this into the show prep document, so I watched it the second time. Oh my gosh, was that blatantly obvious? <laughs> wow, I was like, I don't know if if David Strahan did that on purpose. But if not, I totally understand where he's coming from. <laughs> I feel the same way. I feel like a dirty old man too, David. I understand. Uh, that was odd, and 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 I know that's funny to just focus on her wardrobe. But she also she wears sleeveless shirts with bulletproof vests. Who does that? She wears sleeveless shirts going to a freezer. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She is not holding up to dress code, man. I'm telling you, she has a pass from the FBI. She's got a waiver or something. I don't know what's going on. Anything else from uh, Samar this week that you found interesting? Um, just the continued dynamic between her and wrestler is very interesting to me. To, to, just to see where that relationship is going to play out. You know, I I still don't know, and I, and it's interesting to find out how she's interacting, knowing that she's still on Red's payroll. So the maneuvering she has to do, I'm wondering if there's something else that's going to be paying off for her. And what, like, how do you how do you mean? What do you think? So Samar, I mean, I think that. There's just something about her, like her all season to me, whenever they're working on these cases, it seems like she's thinking either a step ahead or she's thinking about a connection point. She just seems to be deeper in thought about these cases than she probably needs to be. And that, for some reason, that just sits in the back of my head like that's got to pay off at some point is what I was trying to say. I got you. OK, I'm curious because I, I have said this all season that I have some concerns on if Samara's on the up and up. I think she's got a duplicitous side going on. I think there's going to be a little bit more coming from her throughout the season. I don't know if it's going to come in this first portion of the of the season. I think it'll be in the back half. Duplicitous as in she works for the Cabal or duplicitous as in she works for Red and doesn't really care what happens to Liz? No, I think I think there's something with the Cabal. I really do. I, I, I don't know why I think that. I think just a couple looks and nods that she's given throughout this season. Uh, I hope I'm wrong because I really like Samar and I'd, I'd hate to, well, I'd still like her. Who am I fooling? I like bad girls. That's okay. 
<laughs> she can she could be as villainous as she likes. Uh, all right, wrestler, still the white knight, as always, trying to do everything by the book. But he does, by the end of the episode, finally have evidence that the director helped facilitate Solomon. Do you think this will actually help him? No, not at all. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Seems too easy. Yeah, it does. It feels a little too on the book. And, and Samar doesn't feel like it's going to do anything either. And remember, the director's at the task force. So the director could always say, oh, no, well, the, it was the task force's leak in security that actually allowed this information to slip out for Solomon to find Red yeah. and all these other people. So it wasn't our group because we worked out of their facility. Exactly. <laughs> I, I like that he's trying to um, navigate around the director, which I think is kind of what we thought would happen, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah the uh, the hanging up of the phone in the beginning was a little bit too, like, abrupt, I, I would say. Yeah, um, like, hey, what's going on? I don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. And then he's like, well, yeah, of course we're working with Reddington. It's like, well, you just hid the fact that you were working for him, but then you told him you were working for him. It's like, okay, whatever. Well, well, he got busted. Yeah. I mean, he got busted. He's not a good liar. He's he's a white knight. He's eternally a white knight, and that's why I love him as a, I love him as a character. He's a white knight. He's the only character that seems to continuously do what's right. <laughs> I respect that. I, I can tell you this much. With all the people that are hacking into the FAA control system to find planes, and I'm getting on a plane later today, I'm a little nervous that my plane might disappear from the grid. <laughs> I'm nervous that your brain will be gone. I know. Because I'm not going to remember all this stuff. <laughs> Who am I going to call? Who's going to come up with crazy theories? It's not going to be me, because I'm going to think normal. <laughs> uh, Mr. Solomon, we found out the director is working from his own angle. But uh, Mr. Solomon does force the director's hand and almost catches Red at the end. How do you – here's my question about this, okay? So I'm watching the episode, and Solomon seems to meet up with the director rather easily. Well, they're on the same payroll with the same group, so it, it's pretty standard that they probably would get together, right? No, no, I'm saying in terms of – okay, you're a wrestler. Like, say you're a wrestler. You're working at the post office F slash FBI. And you realize I got to work with the guy that is assumed to be working directly with the head of the cabal, right? Like he is at the epicenter of this whole thing. Would you ever let him out of your sight without somebody following him? I suppose you, I would say no, but at the same time, I know that they're the CIA. So even if I had a guy tailing him, he'd probably be dead before I ever knew that I was tailing him. <laughs> True. But I mean, you at least make the effort. And it just seems like. I don't know. The way that it was shot, <laughs> and I watched it twice, and I'm like, eh, it's kind of, I still feel the same. It almost felt like, what, did you just like slip out the back and you just met behind on the marina, behind the office, or what? I mean, I just felt like somebody would be following him, especially if you're so concerned about well, see, that was this that was the science fiction part of the episode that I was trying to figure out, because I swore the director had a teleporter, because he was like in D.C., and then he was somewhere else talking to Solomon, and then he's in the car, and then I'm assuming that the safe the safe deposit box and the restaurant and all that was happening in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So how did the director get from DC to Montreal in like two minutes? Uh, 24 time, 24, 24 time. logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 24 logic applies here. That means we can get anywhere in the world, roughly eight minutes. <laughs> Commercial break. <laughs> Commercial break. I don't look too much. I mean, I get what you're saying, but it's not a real time story. So I don't really think too much about it, but I, the one thing I do want to say is if you really look at this, these first, uh, what episode are we on? Five, six, Six. Six, okay. These first six episodes, if you really look at them, we have lost a big chunk of time. I mean, it seems, I think it's meant to feel like it's only been a couple of weeks, but if you really take each episode, it should be about two months, maybe. I yeah, would, it's I a would good say. possibility. My, my personal theory. My personal I guess theory. We just have to take a look at uh, Liz's roots and see if the Brown's coming back. <laughs> that'll, <laughs> that'll give us a, a, a clear indicator. That's true. Uh, the director, finally, finally, <laughs> Somebody called Wrestler out on helping Red over and over and over again. This part made me happy. The, well, is he helping Red or is he helping Liz? And because you're helping Liz, you're helping Red by default. What's his motive? Well, which, which one is he really helping out? I, I think Liz is the motive, but every week it feels like Red's calling him. Wrestler's saying, I'm not going to help you because I'm going to catch you. And then he ends up helping him anyway. And, and yes, he does end up catching a, a bad guy, but I think at some point somebody would have to call him out on this, and I was just glad that someone finally did, even if it is the guy we don't like. True. True. Uh, but he gets a chance to interrogate a suspect with no eyes on him, recites a little Bible verse properly, I might add. I believe it's the Pulp Fiction verse he was dropping, and he just dropped it correctly. Yep. And uh, admits to, to wanting to be a priest at one point. Are you surprised by any of this? The, the priest thing was kind of an interesting ask. I was kind of like, huh? That's kind of different. Yeah. I was like, I wonder why he 
wants to be a priest where he's trying to do good in the eyes of the Lord. And now he's this sinister member of the cabal, <laughs> uh, which is interesting because then it was like, okay, well, if this is a stretch, this is full Heinrich's here. But <laughs> if he wants to be a priest or a bishop or whatever you want to call it, a member of the, the clergy, um, then, and they have this cabal, it's almost kind of like old, like 13, 1400s, you know, early Catholic church mm-hmm. and all the conspiracies going on there. So I'm wondering if that might come into play with all this religious undertone. Oh, very much. That's, that's an interesting, I, 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 at first I thought maybe they're just throwing it in there because there's so much religious overtone in this episode. I mean, it, it's obvious and blatant that we talked about earlier, but as I thought about the episode, I, I wondered if maybe it's because we're trying to build a redemption story almost for the director, like to show, you know, he didn't, he wasn't always this guy either. He didn't want to be this, this guy. And somehow he got wrapped up into being this guy. Yeah, and if it's like all the other characters, right? Tom didn't want to be who he was. The the major just picked him up off the street and turned him into that. Mm-hmm. Red Red didn't want to be who he was. He was forced into it. Alan didn't want to be part of it. And now Liz didn't want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. So I, I think this is all something about these people are coming from, you know, simpler, better lives at one point. And it's really a matter of who's going to win at the end and get back. The ultimate prize at the end of this isn't like global domination or world currency or anything like that. It's truly to get back what they lost. That's the ultimate prize at the end. Absolutely. And I did notice something uh, just coming from the James Bond movie, Spectre, where it's about a giant global organization, uh, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, giant global organization, the Cabal, giant global organization. There seems to be a trend, right? (laughs) Like movies and TV shows are really building around this. There's a giant global organization where leaders, powerful leaders, are conspiring to control everything my question to you is do you think there is a legitimate version of the cabal out there oh absolutely do you (laughs) you can't be a conspiracy uh conspiracy theorist or anything like that especially watching all of this television some of this has to come from somewhere right Mm. like like stories are always rooted in some kind of truth at the end of the day so Somewhere along the way, there was at least a start. I mean, Alias had it too, right? The 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 group of mm-hmm. the twelve, uh, Continuum had the corporate Congress and the fact that world governments were overthrown and corporations ruled everything. I mean, this is all things that kind of happen today. I mean, you talk about you know the lobbyist in Washington if you're in the United States and the fact that you know corporations are controlling what laws get passed so they can have their tax breaks and yada yada yada. I mean, all of that is could spiral into something bigger, something more maniacal, if you will. I, I think it's totally plausible that it's out there. Do you think they're listening right now? Uh, if they are, uh, uh, you'll know when my plane goes down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll miss you, Troy. I'll miss you. All right. Well, how about Liz? Uh, I, I don't really think, I feel like she only said like six or seven lines this entire week, but she, yeah, she was a little bit of a background player. Almost a, a little bit a rom like, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> if she she's a, she's a she's a tea fetcher, <laughs> she's a, hey, the clock's running, let's hurry this up kind of person. She wasn't actually really involved in the episode at all. I really think if they they pulled her back a little bit because they had to get some of these threads played out and or put into place, I should say. So they need to get this done, and she needed to be put in the background because the next couple episodes are really going to be all about her. Yeah, because she didn't even scoff at Red Story when she when he was talking to Crispin. But I have formed an opinion, and it's, I think it's going to be an unpopular opinion. I don't really, you know, that's, that's, that's what happens, but opinions. I think I can firmly say now I do not think she should be redeemed in terms of her job. Like, I don't think she should ever get her job back. Based on this episode, I don't think she wants to be redeemed. No. She this, was all like, she's like, here's your suitcase. Go get them. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> She willingly she all in on it. participated in a bank robbery. Even if it's to save her own butt, she still willingly participated in a bank robbery. She sat there and watched as Red shot another person, which this is like, what, the second or third person? She just watched Red shoot And didn't unarmed. at least question it. Like, it'd be one thing if like you watch him shoot him. She could at least say something like, was that really necessary? And she you know, did the first time. And she slowly but surely gotten on board with Red, I think, where she's like, eh, this is just part of the life. You know, this is just this is just part of doing business with Red. I mean, even the audience was shocked that he shot Crispin. Yeah, very much so. But but she wasn't phased at all. Very much so. So for me personally, as a viewer, 
I have come to the conclusion that she should not be redeemed in in the resp- like I think she should be clear to the terrorism because she wasn't a terrorist. Right, the Uriah bombing, correct. But she should never be employed by the government again. I don't see how I don't see a single way. I've thought and thought and thought for the last uh, 24 48 hours trying to come up with a, a scenario where I could justify believing that she would be reinstated. Well, she could be re- not necessarily she could still work for the government but not officially in an official capacity. Mm-hmm. She'd be a consultant like Red is. Well, do they you do that all the time. Yeah. Well, do you see any scenario where she should be employed again as an agent? As an agent? No, not at all. Do you think, in terms of the show, not just your personal opinion, in terms of the Re- show? Yeah, regardless of anything she's done in season three, she still shot the AG, mm-hmm. cold blood. You're done at that point. That That's all you. That's what I'm saying. Unless you believe the JFK theory, but the magic bullet. I don't think anybody does. No. The magic bullet. That's That's a fan really trying to make her clear. That's a thing that just makes salsa. <laughs> All right. Well, we didn't have a whole lot of, with Liz, but we did have a lot of red. We found out that he will he will even buy a restaurant to get a, an inspector in line. Can you explain this storyline to me a little bit? I got a little I am super confused. I couldn't. I, I someone said that the the pastry chef was his daughter. I think it's I his girlfriend. It his, I thought it was his mistress. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought it was somebody he was re, in a relationship with because I mean he's trying to keep her happy. And so they're, they're doing this construction and making it happen and all this other stuff, right? And at the end of the day, all they want to do is just knock out the wall to get into the next room. <laughs> I, I figured this was going to be something bigger, like they were actually going to construct the safe deposit box and then literally make it look like Red stole it, send a video to the director. That's what I thought. Yeah. I, I was, it was like, what's, I'm confused. <laughs> and I'm at a loss for words because I'm so confused. I thought it was going to be like, now you see me, where it's all just an optical illusion. And instead, it was just a bank robbery. Right. I didn't lead at all where I thought it was going to go. I th- I really thought it was much more involved, like you did. And it turns out, not so much. But I do I do like that he would actually go buy a restaurant just to buy this guy. Well, and the thing here is that, at least you can say that the, the show writers and the runners and everything, it's consistency, right? Mm-hmm. Because in this case, it was consistent that... I thought one thing and it was something else. The part is that sometimes that works off and you're like, holy crap, that was awesome. Like the twist with um, uh, the gin, right? But mm-hmm. in this case, it was like, holy crap, that is really lame. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like we're bagging on this episode a lot. And I'm sure there's some people getting really turned off by that. And I apologize. But, you know, you have to call it like you see it. You can't just praise every episode if it doesn't deserve the praise that you're giving it. I don't think. And I think we're just we're just explaining the problems that we had with the episode and the things we liked about the episode. There's a lot of cool stuff in this this episode as well, and a yeah, like, lot like, of stuff that is building that I think is going to pay off great. Like the cool thing was when um, Red turns over to um, Marvin, and he just kind of like does that slow head turn, and he's like, "Well, don't look at me. I didn't know that was going to happen." Oh, that was a great moment. <laughs> that was such a great <laughs> was moment. A great <laughs> moment. Uh, but he did. Uh, he stages a bank robbery, kills Crandall, uses a couple thumbs, takes out the director's finances. Do you think this is a good plan? Do you think this plan is actually going to pay out? This plan was perfect until one final flaw actually happened, and that's whenever you go into a bank robbery, you remove your shoes. Got to go in your socks only, so you don't leave any footprints behind. Well, you think that's going to do anything? Well, the director obviously knew that he was there. Well, I think he knew he was there because there were thumbs in his safe deposit box. <laughs> I think that was a tip, too. <laughs> Literally, tip of his thumb. Yeah. Oh, uh, there we go. I mean, yes, the boots might have given it away, Troy, but I think the thumbs gave it more away. <laughs> would you Would you just pee yourself if you open a safety deposit box and there are a couple thumbs in there? I'm sitting there going like, whoa, that's different. <laughs> so if we're understanding this correctly, the, the um, Crandall stole uh, Hi- Heimel. What is his name? Homie. Homie? It's not homie. Hall me. Hall me. Okay. Hall me. <laughs> you think as many times as they said it, I haven't memorized by now. So Crandall stole Hall me and had him in his plane. And that's why the director couldn't, like that was director's, how was he ever going to access his finances otherwise? Yeah. I think that was, the issue was that Red knew about Hall me, the direct, probably from the fulcrum, the director was using Hall me for the finance hiding mm-hmm. and something happened along the way that Holmy got captured by Crandall and because of that that's when everybody was like we can't we can't find Holmy so then they had to start working through to find Crispin to in order to get to Holmy okay is how that kind of all twied back tied back together well you right. would think the director would be keeping close tabs on Holmy if he has access to his entire escape fund 
but he's been so concerned about wrestler and the cabal and Solomon that he got maybe sidetracked and Crispin picked him up like a day or two ago and he just didn't have a you know way to keep an eye on him because there was no need to keep an eye on him previously. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Fine, fine, fine. The final line, which he says on the phone in front of a sleeping Liz, is I'm going to bring this whole damn thing down on you, Peter. And wait, wait, let me see if I can do it in my, my best read. I'm going to bring this whole damn thing down on you, Peter. Not very good. Not very good. <laughs> and, the, and when I do... There you go. When I do, your own people will beg me to kill you to stop the bleeding. It was just a great line all around. I think it just shows the strength of Red coming back. Because as we were saying, that Red seems to be kind of duped over the last couple of episodes. Now we have Red kind of reasserting himself. Well, I guess my bigger question is, so he does that. He goes through all of this. This entire episode was about getting this money so he had leverage. And that leverage doesn't work. So is it pointless or is it still going to come into play? Oh, no, it worked. You can see the director sweating on the other end. He's just trying to craftily work his way out of it with words. But he's, he knows he's on the end of a losing battle. Hmm. Very interesting. We're going to see how this plays out. Now, do you think there's some theorists out there that think that uh, Red was actually – he made that call in front of Liz. Even though she looked like she was sleeping, he made it in front of her in the hopes that she hears it so he – continuously buys her trust. I suppose you could reach there if you wanted to. I mean, they're on a plane. There's not much else places you can go that he wouldn't have been out of earshot anyway, even if she was awake. That's so true. It's a, it's a bit of a stretch, I think. How much money do you think Red has? Oh, a ton. Oh, what's a ton? Like a, a billion? I don't know. He got whatever the poachers got from their ivory collection from killing all those elephants. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, is there anything else you got from this episode? No, I'm just glad it was. Uh, I I I was a little disappointed in the whole like telegraph exactly what happened, but then it was kind of cool that he actually did telegraph exactly what happened at the end in the fight scene with uh, to getting to Karakurt. Uh But other than that, it, it was it was fine. You know, I I want to be entertained for 44 minutes. I was entertained. It was it's good enough. It was entertaining. Speaking of, you get to the final shot. We we talked vaguely about it. You got the Karakurt. How is that going to play out? What do you think is going to happen? Tom has him now. So what happens? Does he negotiate? Does he force him to confess on video? What does he do? Oh, I'm sure he's going to drag him right to Cooper. Do you think so? Or do you think he just used Cooper to get there? No, literally, he's going to drag him all the way to Cooper. (laughs) Just by his pinky? No, by the chain. He was pulling him by when he was walking him out at the end of the episode. I got to admit, that was a great shot. It was awesome. Where he's just dragging him through the ground. I thought that was a great shot. And I could Is he still it, alive, I assume? I assume he's still alive. Oh, yeah. He just knocked him out with the gun. He's like, don't kill me. And he's like, not yet. Yeah. And he butts it with the butthead of the gun. And it almost was like that scene was like Tom was a gladiator. Like, I have captured my prize and I am, you know, it, it just seemed like he was in a position of strength in that last shot. I thought it was really well done. I'm t- he looked ripped, too. I mean, he keeps working out. He should do it uh, the next Die Hard, man. He looked like John McClane there at the end. That would be interesting to see his character as Ryan Eggles portraying Tom mm-hmm. as a McLean character. That would be interesting. I would watch that. Do a spinoff. <laughs> I would. Then it keeps the whole Liz and Tom relationship dead in the dirt, and <laughs> you still get Ryan because I really like his performance. I think he's a, he's a great actor. A great actor. Yeah. All right. Well, remember, there's a little bit more of the show left, so hold tight. Remember, be sure to download the Blacklist Exposed app for iOS and Android, and be sure to go even deeper into the mystery of Red Reddington by visiting our partner Blacklist sites, theblacklistnbc.com. That's theblacklistnbc.com. And as well as see the weekly post for Clearing the Red Tape and our Facebook group to go even deeper into this episode. Yeah, now those iTunes reviews we promised. Just want to say a quick thank you again to Supreme Soccer Man, said great podcast. Uh, The Bobster, 911 from the USA. Awesome podcast. Great to hear others' thoughts. Uh, Bonel Dulu from the USA. Fun, insightful recaps. I think that's Bo and Lou. Bo and Lou. Yeah. I, you can read it that way too, I suppose. <laughs> Need some hyphens in there. Yeah. Uh, Peaches.Flossberg, which they used a period, so that was helpful. Uh, excellent podcast all around from the USA. Uh, then we had, I'm never going to do this one, Alki GDGD from the USA said that this is their favorite blacklist podcast. Ms. Jackie K. from the USA said, I love how the podcast isn't just a recap show and they go in-depth and analyze all the characters and their progression. Love it. Uh, hey, ha Nerico from the USA. Exceptional. Love this podcast. Uh, WSJI Names from USA. Nicely done. 
These guys have a bit of an episode recap, but the two hosts have good chemistry and inject playful humor into a more serious analysis of the show. I hate Troy. I just want to <laughs> make sure you say that. Uh, JV Tunes, they take it seriously. The podcast provides actual, thoughtful discussion of the show. Not this but, week, I didn't. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think, sure did not. Well, JV Tunes <laughs> says they don't mince words if there's something they need to call out, but they absolutely love the blacklist a lot. Absolutely. Uh, good podcast, LE828 from Canada. Uh, great podcast, good analysis of the show, a mix of fun, no talk, at least not too much about what the hosts ate for breakfast. I made the switch to this podcast from another one. Woo! Conversions! Yes. I love like it. it. Oh, man. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, really appreciative. No, and there's a lot of, I mean, we, we couldn't read all of them, but let me tell you, some of those were really nice. Well, they're all really nice, but there, there are some very detailed ones that were really, I really appreciate. I'm yeah, just going to say one really one more time. Really. Appreciate really appreciate Because <laughs> yeah. it's one thing to say, you know, five stars, hey, this is great. And there's another time to take a couple minutes out of your day to actually write a paragraph. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now let's see what stories Red has to tell with this week's Red's Rhetoric. <laughs> Apparently, you were all hunting elephants last week as Red Poacher won with 67% of the vote. Our first story this week comes when Red asks Crispin if he is a gambling man. Are you a gambling man, Crispin? No. I have all casinos. <laughs> yes, well, I would agree with you there. But perhaps you're familiar with the old saw, you can't beat the house. No matter how many poor souls you turn into popsicles, the fix is in. The world in which you awaken will be one incapable of sustaining human life. And why? Because at the critical tipping point, one tragically quixotic megalomaniac cannibalized humanity of the very minds that might have been its salvation. You see, if you were a betting man, you would understand that now trumps later every time. The future is a sucker's bet, a maybe, a contingency, a what if. The only thing that is real is the present, and you've plundered it robbed it of the very geniuses it might have averted the dystopia you so fear. Indeed, perhaps, even the very one who might have devised a means to revive your sad, tired, frozen ass. Congratulations, Crispin. You've doubled down on extinction. Life on Earth is going to end. Soon. Cryonics is our only hope. It won't work. I'm betting it will. Ah, so you are a gambling man. Let's place that bet, shall we? You're doubling down. I love it. Oh, you're my red. You're my only hope. Uh, good stuff. That is going to be hashtag Red Gamble this week. Red Gamble, if you'd like to chat with Sir Crispin Crandall. Our second one is going to come at the end of the episode when Red lets the director know that his game is over. Hello, Peter. I hope I'm not interrupting cocktails with Linda. Congratulations on getting to haul me before I did. Yes, it certainly is celebratory drinks here, so I'll be brief. I think it's about time to exonerate Elizabeth Keene. That is not going to happen. Oh, but it is. The only question is whether you'll live to see the day. If I continue to dismantle the cabal, they'll put a bullet in your head just to mitigate their losses. Everything is working according to plan, Peter. You overestimate your influence, Raymond. Your plan is of no concern to us. Peter, you've been skimming from the company till, stealing millions in anticipation of running away. When you were linked to the cabal, you reached out to Halme, put your golden parachute in the secret account only he could access. Except now I've got it. You have no money to escape the inevitable. Your colleagues will abandon you. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but soon enough, because I'm not going to stop until they do. Unless I exonerate Keith. It's one small chance to save your life. Such a generous offer. I'll have to decline. I'm going to bring this whole damn thing down on you, Peter. And when I do, your own people will beg me to kill you to stop the bleeding. I don't know about you, but the hair stand on the back of my neck when I hear that line. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, Spader does it better. Let's just admit, I, I don't do it very well. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, hashtag Red Golden. Red Golden for that one. So let us know which was your favorite by sending us a tweet, posting your vote in the Facebook group, or clip your favorite on Climber. Share it with the world. Add the hashtag again, Red Gamble, 
if you wish to bet on the future of humanity, or red golden if your golden parachute failed to open. Special Agent Intel. Let's find out what you all thought of Sir Crispin Crandall with our Special Agent Intel. Saul thought the episode was rushed. I got lost. I could understand that. Yep, you're in the same boat with the money people. <laughs> uh, Teresa Todd. It's a good episode, but I'm concerned Tom is going to mess up things with Lizzie and Red. That's a no-no. The Procrastor writer. Uh, I see what you did there. Uh, it's hard not to like... Um, What's I am I am Diego? Say that Eddie Eddie Gathegi. Thank you. It's all in Twitter lingo, so I can't read it right. It's hard not to like Eddie uh, Gathegi <laughs> Solomon. He's a scene stealer and a terrific foil, and obviously a much better pronunciator than I am. Uh, follows it up with, "Do you guys actually spend speed up time when we watch these episodes?" I swear, I started five minutes ago. Yeah, it does. It does seem to clip along pretty quick, and I think Daniel even alluded that to his interview. If you haven't heard it, back on episode thirty. Um, that they just they don't have those typical beats where they're waiting for the DNA results to come back, so they can just cut, 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 cut. So it just keeps the pace of the show going. Yeah, the pace. Even if, even an episode I wasn't a huge fan of. I mean, I still felt like it it moved at a good clip. And uh, and a lot of the issues I had the first time, I didn't have as much the second time. So I, I don't want to come across like I'm poo pooing, and I feel like I have, and I don't like being that guy. But stuff you got to call out. Uh, T just goes by T. Episode great when Red Liz are on the screen. Hard to follow. Turned to football when Tom came on. Boring. Ouch. Ouch. I think that's more a product of the storyline, not so much the actor. Yeah. Uh, the Lone Gunman 95. When Red and Liz were on, yes. The other parts were lacking something. Maybe, hmm, Red. Matthew Jeffers. Crisped to perfection. Short, short and sweet. <laughs> yeah, short and sweet. Brendan Williams. This episode was fantastic. Awesome music. Kept you on the edge. Went by so fast. Now... Real quick, all those variances and opinions, there's a, yeah, it was okay, and it was great. What what do you attribute to that difference? I think it depends on what you're looking for in the show when you're watching it. There's the people that are like, I want the mythology only, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the other people that are like, I want the blacklister to be super cool. And then there's the other people that are like, I want this blacklister to be part of the mythology. Mm -hmm. So I think depending on which camp you're in depends on how you like the episode. It's a good argument. All right, we got one more, Troy. Uh, yeah, Suzanne said, the blacklist has been a pure adrenaline rush for four episodes four and five. That's how I like it. I suppose it's good to slow things down every once in a while as long as the story remains captivating. Episode six, however, didn't captivate me till the very end, and even then it fell a little bit flat. Hope things will speed up for the last two episodes before the fall break. Seems the writers are deliberately trying to show us that Red isn't always right on top of his game. Last week, we saw Red totally duped by Slimeball Vargas. Honestly, was disappointed to see Red let himself be put into such a dire situation with not much wiggle room. It'd be cool if there was a blacklister named Wiggle. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, I was disappointed in him for the first time. Red also took a misstep with the building inspector in episode six. We all expect Red to be the intellectual winner. I'm not sure I enjoy seeing him so vulnerable. In the end of episode six, Red is back in control where he always belongs. In regards to Tom's journey finding Kara Kurt, it left a little bit more that to be desired. All that work, and he essentially catches the guy with very little effort. In fact, we weren't allowed the aspect of surprise on just how he would capture Kara Kurt because he narrated the whole thing before it happened. Boo. Just way too lackluster. And poor Asher. And why are we supposed to care? We didn't even know him. Ouch. Valid points. Uh, except the red thing, I, I will disagree on that. Point. I like a little vulnerable in my in my lead character, even if it is, you know, if you, if you show somebody that never has a weakness, I have a hard time believing them. If you show me some vulnerabilities along the way, I can get behind them a lot more. Even Superman has kryptonite. That's right. Everybody's got to have a little something, something. All right. We had a voicemail here from Neil. Hello, this is Neil from Bowie calling in for the Blacklist Exposed uh, episode, Sir Crispin Crandall. Uh, another real nice episode here. Uh, Tom was, uh, went back on his word to uh, protect that kid, but uh, he did manage to get Kara Kurt, and that was a really nicely played sequence there uh, when we outlined what he was going to do, and then it happened almost close to exactly what he said. Another highlight was the uh, look on the director's face when he heard about uh, Red taking those thumbs. I mean, he was just uh, 
great look of worry there. It's good that wrestler has some evidence. Uh, one thing which I hate about the promo department is whenever they say, this next time is the last episode before the final. Why don't they just say there's two more episodes left? Anyway, uh, that's all. Looking forward to podcast. Matter of fact, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. I love Neil. And, and Neil, I, I hate when they use penultimate, you know, which means like the episode before the last episode. Because it's just like, huh? Most people don't even know what that word means. Stop using that. I just call it a Fortnite or something. Too. Yeah, just stop being so complicated. But I, I, you know what? I actually don't watch promos. I think I've said this in the show many times, but if you didn't know that, I never watch the promo for the next week's episode because I don't want to know anything. I don't want to hear the NBC because they're always going to pimp something that either doesn't happen or happens and it's very minimal. It, it's it. Hey, this week we're going to find out this, and you never find that out. <laughs> you never find it out. All right. Well, Andrew said. This episode was a mediocre episode for me. The only interesting part was seeing Marvin Gerard again and his contribution to the episode. However, I liked how Red managed to buy off the inspector after his first attempt to bribe him failed by giving his daughter slash lover. <laughs> nobody, can, nobody knows what the heck this girl it's wants. It's very complicated. We really, need, uh, we really need that defined. A restaurant, although I noticed the money he gave them was not Canadian dollars, but some other currency. Hmm. Hmm. Another thing to note. Uh, that I did not expect, Sir Crandall would be operating from an Airbus A380 jet plane, which is the biggest passenger plane in the world and is a double-decker jet. I thought he was operating from a building somewhere. A few things to note, that Reddington was in Montreal, which is not too far from where I'm from. At least Canada exists in the Blacklist universe. I, well, I would hope so. <laughs> you can't just get rid of Canada. I don't care how good a TV show you are. It would be interesting. I have a theory that the director and Mr. Solomon are going to have a showdown where one would kill the other for control of the cabal or the director with his back to the wall is going to cooperate with the post office in Reddington in taking down the cabal. Yeah, that was one of my original theories was that something's going to happen that Red's going to pressure the director to have the director flip. Yeah, I think so. I think the director's days are numbered. That's what I think. I don't think he lasts much longer than that mid-season finale. Personal opinion. And uh, let's get into our next voicemail. Hello, I've seen a uh, post on Facebook to call this number on thought of the uh, Blacklist episode number 86. And I just wanted to say it, uh, it's definitely one of the best uh, that in previous weeks. And uh, it just looks like the show is getting much better and better and better. So I just wanted to leave that feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, the best over the last couple of weeks. An interesting hey. spin there. Well, you know what? I think you were talking earlier about the mythology and whatnot, and I guess I didn't add my thoughts. My thoughts are I think some people like the slower, more character-driven episodes, and this felt a little bit more like that instead of the quick pace, let's get bam, 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 action, action, uh, let's keep the plot moving. It's like a thriller. You know, It's a constant plot device moving us forward. This felt more, it's really about building the story up and the characters. Even though I don't think it did the job it was intending to do very well, it just, I, I think some people prefer it because of that. Well, and it's almost a little bit more of a throwback to season one, too. This is the first kind of blacklister where there was a, uh, a real kind of weird creepiness factor to them. So mm -hmm. it almost was a little bit of season one. I guess the gin was kind of like that, but this was really one where it was just kind of just a standalone out there procedural type app. Yeah. And I think some people really just prefer the procedural because it's supposed to be easier to follow. <laughs> Sometimes, although I'm still trying to figure out, did I just get a Bible lesson? I don't know what happened. <laughs> uh, Joni said, I was surprised Tom killed his new friend like that. What happened to the young guy's girlfriend? See, other people want to know about Gwen, too. I want to know where she's at. If she needs a place to hide, I'll, I'll pick her up. <laughs> uh, Betty said, I'm really glad to see the story go in the direction of the task force trying to exonerate Liz. I love the part two when Red got all of the contents of the director's safety deposit box and negotiating power he now has over the director. Mm -hmm. Agree. Agree. Uh, Terry said to close it out, I loved last night's episode. I don't get when people complain that there is not enough blood and guts. Sometimes I find it's necessary to slow it down just to get the story told. I give this episode two thumbs up. If you catch my drift, <laughs> well, that was a fabulous scene. I see what you did there. She she also followed up like real quick, and she got it in last minute. I think the FBI may become so affected by the cabal, wrestler may lose his job, and be forced underground with Red and Lizzie. What do you think about that? His own new criminal network. Mm. It's a satellite office in the States. Do you think wrestler could be turned? I don't know. I mean, it's tough because he's been working with Red for so long now, but he also chased Red for so long. 
So the question is, if, if he's turned, he's turned because he's doing it more for Liz or Samar or Ram, not for Red. Mm, very good. Okay. Just curious. Just curious. That's going to conclude this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter this season at the Blacklist GSM, where we live tweet during the East Coast feed, and we use the show's hashtag, The Blacklist. We also have a Facebook group to search for The Blacklist Exposed and join us for the fun. Intel from you is what we want, and we have a few ways you can submit Intel into the agency. You can interact with us on Tumblr, Instagram, Clamor, or as always, visit theblacklistexposed.com. Remember, the Blacklist GSM is the handle wherever you look. That is where we will be. All right. And you can also subscribe to the podcast in iTunes or, and leave us a review. Join the contest or listen from the website. If you're really on the go, though, make sure you download our app for iOS and Android. It's powered by Spreaker. It's a great app and it works fantastic. You will also find all the intel and analysis about this episode for Sir Crispin Crandall by visiting theblacklistexposed.com. Uh, before I depart, I also want to mention that Troy and that sexy voice you hear at the very beginning of the episode, Daryl, uh, both popped on for Remake This Movie Right, which is coming out, I think, uh, in a couple days for Big Trouble in Little China. If you're a fan of that movie, you should check it out. You get to hear all three of us finally. Yeah, what website is that at? Uh, RemakeThisMovieRight.com. Awesome. Can't wait to hear it. Big thanks uh, for listening. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, and don't forget, we still have our profiling question for all of you out there. Which is, what is Red's endgame to clear Liz? Can't wait for your answers. We'll see you next week. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right. We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production, copyright 2015. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.